party started. So our first panel member is none other than our superstar that has been working in the, in the business for the better part of now eight and a half years with his own place, but he's been in Charleston for about 18 years now. He got started on his own with very little help. Um, you might have seen him back in the day if you were here at Moe's, and then he started his own place, the recovery room. He's probably responsible for some of your hangovers. Please welcome Boston. Any seat, sir. All right. Our next panel member is none other than Dell's Darling. She's a health food coach, raw food chef, and a, the juice lady herself. She has had her business for a good part of a few years now. Uh, first on Cannon Street with Dell's, and then she started Dell's Vibes, and now Uptown Dell's. If you guys haven't been there, Go check it out. The Jazzy Pizza is a life changer. Please welcome Smarel Nicole Brown. And last but not least, our gracious host. He's been working just about every job in the industry. Uh, he started his business in Charlotte, then moved out here, and also now has a place in Atlanta as well. He has been recently named top 40 under 40. Please help me welcome. Patrick Whalen. All right, guys. You ready to get this started? All right, so I remind you that Creative Mornings is about positivity, it's about respect, and it's about just really being inspired. So that's what we're going to maintain here today with lots of questions, and we're going to get a little panel discussion for about 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to let you guys join in and just ask whatever you want to this audience here. All right? Let's get this party started. I'm going to play Maury Povich today, guys. Is that okay? <laughs> Is that generational? Does everybody know Maury Povich? All right. Patrick, I'm going to start with you, sir. Um, you've been in this business for quite some time. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got started here. I know you, you came from Charlotte, moved to Charleston, and now you're getting five church done here, done in Atlanta. You've done just about every job. You started as a busboy. Tell me a little bit about that. About being a busboy? Not being a busboy, but how you got from that to now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I started in the business as a, as a busboy and um, dishwasher and uh, line cook. Uh, I worked at some prestigious places like Atlanta, Atlanta Bread Company, which was a pretty hot spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good chicken salad sandwich. Um, it, and it used to be here somewhere? Uh, in this space, as yeah. a matter of fact, yeah. <laughs> we had to remove some uh, piping out of the ceiling because they had tubes that would run from the bread oven to the street to pump the bread smell out. Uh, get that's how they do it. Craving it, I guess, on the street. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, when we opened Five Church in Charlotte, uh, which is our original store, we, we, we did so, um, I always say this, and I might be too early for it, but we did so as like a big f*** you to corporate restaurants, right? We didn't want to be corporate. Um, we wanted to be different. Uh, we put a book on our ceiling. We put a tree in the restaurant. We... Um, have our staff wear chucks, which pisses them off endlessly. Um, we just like to be different and challenging and always kind of pushing the envelope as far as what we do. Um, and that's shown through our staff and through our management. Um, and my role in that is is usually just an instigator. I just like to like, you know, go to somebody like, hey, what do you think? Let's do this. And then they, they come up with what's, you know, creative or interesting about it, and then we go. Um, but that's, that's just the very, very short story of this restaurant. Yeah, and so you're now the co the co-owner of all three locations as well as like you're the director of operations as well. You run all of them. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that's a big task. We'll go with that. I'm the auditor. <laughs> awesome, um, Smarel. If I can ask you the same question. So you you are a raw food chef, right? And you started this business in a town where shrimp and grits and buttery biscuits are reign supreme, right? How was that for you, getting your business going in such a niche market then, but now turning it into a normal thing here in Charleston? Um, well, I guess I would have to give credit to my mom with the background that she's had with my grandfather being a farmer. Um, I've kind of grown up in a healthy food um, household but also I had you know my mom and my stepdad as chefs my stepdad is from here originally so 
we kind of grew up with a lot of the Southern food, but I, I never really liked it because it just felt so heavy. I just felt so lethargic after I would get done eating. Um, I didn't really know about the vegetarian lifestyle. I didn't care. I just wanted to, to feel better. Um, and so when we had Dell's Deli, my mom was just like, you need to go, you need to go do your own thing because everything she was making, I was like, mom, you have too much rice and people shouldn't have that. So she was just like, go open up the juice bar. Um, and that was really tough, I'll say, because I think we had the juice joint, at the farmer's market, and we had um, Planet Smoothie, but there was nothing that was like um, just completely plant-based in Charleston at the moment. And so for me, I got a lot of headache from the city and all that. I guess you'll probably ask questions about that later. Yeah, but, um, we'll get to it. That was really tough because even my mother, who's known for um, the vegetarian um, restaurant stuff in Charleston, um, she was just like, you can't do that. You can't make it in Charleston with just smoothies and juices in one location. You have to put dairy in there. And I don't know. I was just like, Mom, you believed in yourself with a, a tiny hole in the wall. So I know I can do it, too. Wow. So. It was just my passion, I guess. Yeah, and now you're a holistic health coach. Excellent. Beautiful. Boston. So, like I said, you're probably responsible for a lot of hangovers. You, you managed <laughs> one of the, the most communal spaces in Charleston, and you moved up there when nobody was going that far down or up King Street. Um, you know, Upper King was, what, coming into its beginnings, few places moving in here and there and then you were like yeah I'm gonna go right up on the other side of that overpass um, what was it like for you getting started I know you you've been here for quite some time you graduated from CFC stuck around you were a server bartender and then got your own place tell me a little bit about that um, good morning everyone by the way um, I went to bed at 4 35 last night so <clears throat> if I'm dragging a little bit I'm I apologize um, yeah, my neighbor growing up as a kid owned a little dive bar, Luke's Lounge, and he always seemed like a happy guy. And my dad was a Boston public school teacher, and my mom was a nurse. And I was like, I want to be more like Mr. Higgins. Like, that guy is cool. So, uh, yeah, I came down here. I worked at Moe's Crosstown. And working up there, I learned a lot. I'd worked in other bars, clubs, worked at a strip club, worked at many different places um, all throughout um, growing up. But I think when I worked at Moe's, I saw a niche that at that time, back in 2003, Moe's was the only bar restaurant really north of the Crosstown. And we, uh, when I first started there, we had bands, we did um, all sorts of stuff. And uh, then we started doing food, like really pushing the food. Got recognized City Paper, Best uh, Burger, recognized in a couple magazines as like a great bar. And I started losing my bar patrons. I was a bartender. Like, I was like... I don't care about food. Like, I'm here to make a buck behind the bar. I want to sling shots and beer. That's where I make my money at the end of the night. And luckily for me, the people that live next door to Moe's Crosstown own the building and the club that um, Recover Room is now in. It was a club for 30 years prior. And I got to know them over the years, and they offered me the lease. And I think going down there, it wasn't necessarily that I thought that part of town was going to be hip or cool. I start going up King Street, but that... I knew my regulars from Moe's would follow me down there, and uh, that was my goal. It was also really cheap, and I had absolutely no money. So um, I needed some place that a mm, second mortgage on a house on the east side could provide enough capital to get open. Yeah, no, I mean, You definitely have maintained that integrity of you know cheap drinks, good space, all welcome. That's really amazing. And can you tell me a little bit? I'll just keep going with you. What are some of the challenges you've experienced? You know, what? Who, how did you get any help? Who helped you? Did the city help you? People help you? What was your biggest challenge from it? Um, sure. I, luckily for me, everyone helped me. Um, like I said, I didn't have a whole lot of money to open up. So we were in there. Every one of my friends, uh, my brother came down from Boston. He's in the Merchant Marine. So luckily for him, he's three months on, three months off. So very conveniently, he had about a month off to come down, help me paint, build a bar, do as much as we can in the restaurant uh, bar together. Um, my staff, unbelievable. We still have, uh, there's still four of us that started there eight and a half years ago, and they were there before we even opened. So uh, we got a good thing going. I always say, you know, you go into a bar and you see the same people behind the bar for years. It must be a good place to work. Um, and then just regulars, just people coming in, no matter how tired I was that first couple years when I was like bartending every night, and people were like, 
no, don't give up. It's amazing. <laughs> like, you can't go anywhere. So I think it's just, you just got to kind of push through it. And it's tough, but ask for help. That's the biggest thing. Don't be scared. Um, there's a million contacts out there. I mean, something like this, I didn't know about, but, you know, everyone in here, whether they're small business owners or interested in small business, most people that are successful desperately want to share. Um, I've spoken at the College of Charleston three times to their entrepreneurship class that I took when I was at CFC, and I was so honored to go down there. And all those kids call me up now, and they're like, well, we're thinking about doing this. Can we take you to lunch and ask you questions? So, yeah, just anyone and everyone, just ask for help and don't and listen. That's the big thing. Um, Smurl, what were some challenges for you? And, you know, generally you started that conversation, but please tell me a little bit more about your market that you're in. As with the, the challenges or? of, yeah, starting a raw food um, vegan menu. I don't think we had many challenges starting Dell's because, I mean, my mom, she doesn't really follow, like, I mean, if you know Dell, she's just, she's herself. And she was just like, I found this really cool location. And at that time, Cannon Street was not um, up and coming. It was just a little spot. And actually, the person that she was supposed to go into partnership with, with that location, he was like, oh, no, I would not be caught dead in doing this. And she was just like, OK, bye. And um, for her, she just stuck with what she believed in. And she was just like, I'm going to make this work. And people are going to love this location. And I remember having, um, I was in the deli with her. And this guy walked in. And he was just like, this makes no sense. Like, I can't even think. He was like, it makes no sense. But it also makes a lot of sense at the same time. But I mean, out of that location, she opened up um, three more locations. But I think one of the biggest challenges when you're not um, getting banks to sponsor what you're doing or you're not getting investors or you don't have um, a trust fund to back you up is um, following your gut. And for her, that was, you know, I mean, since we're being transparent, our biggest challenge was when we had to close our two locations. Not because we weren't making enough revenue, not because the rent was expensive, but because there were some things that failed to be maintained. And so she was just like, I rather have my integrity and feel good about how I'm serving my customers and not deal with all the, the bull crap that was in our ceilings and everything. So I think the biggest challenge is following your heart and um, not giving up when it gets tough. So well, it's inspirational. And it's all family run, right? Your mom's usually cooking just about every day. No, You're, not no. anymore. No, no, not anymore. She's in California right now. Awesome. So my brother, he, um, my brother is the rock. Like he holds He's the rock. us down. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And you're running behind the scenes. You're doing marketing. You're pushing Dells and uh, your I'm, other I'm projects. Kind of, I'm everything yeah. for my mom. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Patrick, um, you definitely have a little bit of a different experience, and you're you're managing three different locations at the moment. You are a newcomer, fairly newcomer to Charleston. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in that sense and that challenge moving into a new town and getting started here in Charleston right, when I know right. you wanted to do it before right. you came. Um, yeah, our first intention was before we opened in Charlotte was to open in Charleston. Uh, we looked at the space that Macintosh is now in when it was empty. We looked at the space that Indaco was in uh, when there was a giant gaping hole in the ceiling. Um, <laughs> We looked at a lot of those spaces on Upper King, <clears throat> sort of at the beginning of that wave, and um, we just couldn't make a deal. Uh, we couldn't work anything out, uh, and so we didn't end up coming down here. We found the space in Charlotte. We opened five churches in Charlotte instead to start. Um, coming in as an outsider, which I would suppose I am, or that we are, um, y you know, I, I think that Charleston wants to make sure that you're not here to carpet bag, to you know, to come in and profit off of the, the good things about Charleston without investing in the things that are challenging about Charleston. Um, and certainly the construction process, uh, you know, we've got a beautiful old church here, uh, but beautiful old church usually means like one year of delays. Um, and so, you know, that's interesting. But, but that's, I mean, when you're coming to Charleston, that's the best part about it. It's also at times the most challenging. 
Um, and then also, frankly, the reception we open on Market Street. Uh, I make no pretenses about what Market Street is to probably lots of people here. I get it. Um, when I lived in New York, going to Times Square was the last thing that I wanted to do. Um, but ultimately, I think that the city of Charleston seems to be sort of migrating in waves throughout the town. And, and if the growth keeps going the way that it is, I think everybody will ultimately do really well here uh, uh, as long as they operate at a high level. And going back to the beginning of what I was saying is that, um, you know, I think people in Charleston wanted to make sure that when we opened here, this is personal to Five Church, that we were for real, that we weren't, you know, no offense, but we weren't with Chris coming in across the street. I'm not bashing them. Uh, they have their business model. We have ours. But I own the restaurant. I started this restaurant five years ago on a beverage napkin in a bar, a lot like your story, where I was like, you know, let's try to scrape some, some pots and pans together and make enough money to, to start something up. We started in Charlotte. We were crazily underfunded, like embarrassingly underfunded. And uh, we made it go. We made it go through a lot of muscle and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of smart decisions that we got lucky on. Um, so coming here, uh, I moved here. Um, I moved here with my family to make sure that the store was run right. And I think that's a really important distinguishing factor between us and what I think the perception is about a lot of the business coming to Charleston right now, which is that, oh, it's not homegrown. There's just people here to make money off the city. Uh, we want to be a part of the fabric of the community. And, and, and this is a great example. We're really excited to host this event today. Yeah, I mean, you came to Market Street of all places where very few want to venture that way. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about saturation. And what do you what do you see happening? I mean, the interest is there. Everybody's want, wanting to come in. Everybody realizes the viability of starting a food business here. It's got a lot of attention. We're what in three different publications as number one city yep. for for this or for that. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what is there a cap? You think? Yeah. Yeah. We're there. We're past it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm part of that. To be candid, I'm, I'm part of the problem, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, I think probably Charleston capped out two years ago. Um, and that's why you're seeing a lot of places that are really awesome uh, closing, which is unfortunate. I lived through the recession in New York City, and you saw a lot of really amazing places close. That being said, a cap is not something that's, in, you know, in perpetuity. A cap is a short-term problem that as the growth of the city from an organic standpoint um, catches up, then the growth can kick back in again. Um, you know, right now, I have brokers in a lot of different places because they wanted to, us to open all over the place because that seems to be the model for restaurant groups these days. Oh, open 35 churches in every East Coast city. So it's like, all right, every East Coast city is going to have a five church. It's going to have a husk. It's going to have a, you know, Fort Fry restaurant from Atlanta. It's just boring, you know, so... We wanted to focus on having really great restaurants in the only cities that we have. But you hear about what's happening on, in other cities. And, and now Nashville is like the hot city. Or Greenville, South Carolina. You guys been to Greenville? It's like th the hotness right now for restaurants. It's bizarre. I mean, I grew up in Charlotte, and Greenville was like, a, not, like nothing. You like waved at it as you drove to Atlanta. Now it's like a happening <laughs> town. Um, so I think allowing Charleston to not be the hot market and just be a really great market and like really great operators instead of big corporate groups coming in here. The other group that was bidding on the space besides us was Del Frisco's. Do you guys know that? Del Frisco's Steakhouse, you guys know that brand? You guys awake? Um, <laughs> like, so do you want a Del Frisco's on Market Street? Do you want a Five Church? And I think that's sort of the question that Charleston's going to be asked over and over again. I think a little recession is not the worst thing in the world because it kind of turns off those guys that just want to come charging in and make a quick buck rather than invest in the community. That's a great point. Smurl, what do you think about that? What about this whole saturation in the market? Um, personally, I miss the feeling that um, we had when we were first opening Dell's Deli. I miss the feeling of, I mean, I think, fortunately, we have a very, very um, loyal following. No matter where Dell's is, people will come. Um, I just... I, I'm not really too keen on like there being a Panera Bread right on, you know, um, what is that Calhoun. street? Calhoun Street. You know, I, I remember walking to CFC, going to class, and knowing, you know, the business owners. And now it's like that we have Walgreens, which is, you know, that's great because we can, you know, get things that we need 
all the time, but I just, I, I like the local feel. I, I miss that. And, you know, we have yeah. some people like Patrick here that are newcomers and they're doing, you know, awesome things. But I just, I love the feeling that Charleston had, which is why we came to Charleston because of the, the first of all, the, the richness of the history, both good and bad, but also because um, we just wanted to be a part of something that was, that had a local and like a homey feel. But I guess, I mean, I heard from um, one of my friends in real estate that Charleston is becoming, um, like, per square foot, we're getting more expensive than Manhattan. So, you know. Feels like it. Yeah. yeah like, I don't know. I'm not really with it. I like, <laughs> I, I miss the old Charleston, yeah. I guess. So. And it's tough, too, right? Because, I mean, if you want your city to grow, those yeah. are the headaches, right? And I think that's probably why my mom is not, we're not focused on going back on King Street. We love the, the Rutledgeville and we have, you know, other plans in, in that side of town instead of this town. We want to deal with the locals and the residential community, so. Wow. Nice. Boston, what do you think, man? I mean, I think if you have a good product, it doesn't matter. Saturation. The saturation is definitely here. Uh, Westendorf, I think, just closed the other day. That was a great restaurant. But, wow. you know, I mean, it's hard when you have restaurants, um, especially a lot of similar restaurants seem to be open. I, I swear to God, everyone's hiring the same architect. And I'm like, wow, globe ball with uh, fun light. It's just like, all right, bullshit. You know, be a little more creative than that. Anyhow. Um, yeah, so if you have a good product... It doesn't matter. You're gonna stay, you're gonna do fine. Um, and I don't think that's really the issue. I think the issue, some of it is, yeah, the real estate, if you're coming in trying to open up something new and these leases are insane. I've looked at multiple leases. I am not really interested in opening any other bars, but people are constantly calling me, being like, you gotta check this out. It's gonna be such an amazing place. You just kill it. And then I look at the lease and I'm like, you're out of your mind. Like, you're crazy. Um, so that being said, you know, I think market forces will eventually kind of dictate what happens and, you know, good stuff will stay. People that have deep pockets will be able to stay. I mean, eventually you got to close if you're not making money. But um, the other thing they do in other cities, and you can't do it here in South Carolina. South Carolina, the liquor licenses are controlled by state, not city. So for me, like growing up in the Boston area, I grew up in actually Quincy, which is the first city south of Boston. They only have 100 liquor licenses. So there's a cap, and then once that hits, maybe they'll release a couple more here and there, but you end up having to buy. You have to wait either for somebody to go out of business or you go into a business and you're like, hey, I, wanna, I know your business is going out of business and it's not really worth anything, but I'm going to give you $300,000 just for your liquor license to hang on the wall. Here in Charleston, they don't do that. So it's like a free-for-all. I think a liquor license is... Uh, it costs you maybe six grand for beer, wine, and liquor for like two years. I mean, I can make that in a night. Um, so it's just like, and people hear that and they're just like, oh, I want to, you know, get a liquor, do it, do it, do it. And the state's just trying to, they want that excise tax money. Every, every liquor drink you sell, every beer that gets sold in this state is taxed. And that's what they want. And I think uh, maybe the city could control business licenses or something to kind of slow down the saturation. But in the end... I was given an opportunity to open my own business, so the last thing I'm going to do is get up at a city council meeting and say, no, we can't allow more businesses to open or we have to cap times that open because everyone should have the opportunity that I had. Oh, that's interesting. Um, let's change the subject because we can probably talk about this all day, right? Um, food, and, food and Bev pet peeves. What's yours, Boston? Have your drink order and your money ready when you come to the bar. It is unbelievable. Like, I know you've been waiting for a couple minutes to get a drink, and then when I'm like, hey, what's up? What can I get for you? And they're like, I don't know. What do you have? <laughs> you know, or like, hey, what's on tap? I don't know. There's only eight, and you're standing right in front of them. <laughs> so just, you know, get your shit together. And, and, and my thing is, I mean, we're a late night bar. We are at the end. We're not upper king. We're like upper, upper king. Now it's a little different with everything that's opened up by Santi, so it's kind of fun. We're kind of in the middle, and we're getting, we get crowds from both ends coming at the end of the night being like, I know where's a great idea to go at 1245 at night. So I try and give them the benefit of a doubt that I'm like, you've probably been drinking for about four hours now, so I hope you're not this dumb. But that's my, uh, that's my pet peeve, sticking with it. That's beautiful. Smart L? 
Um, I mean, we love our customers. We do. Um, it's okay. <laughs> I guess if you know we close at eight o'clock and it's seven fifty-five, and you're you're coming in like hi, especially if my mom's there. I mean, if it's eight o'clock and they're like Dell, but you know, I just I just ran here and my mom's like okay. And everybody's trying to go. Um, that's probably a lot of people's pet peeves in F and B. It's like you know we're about to close and it's 7:55. My mom taught us you don't go in the kitchen when it's like 20 minutes till closing because you never know what might be in your food because the cook might be mad at you. You know, but that's um, great advice. <laughs> that doesn't happen at Dell's though. Trust me. No. No at Recovery Room. Not at your place. Yeah. No. <laughs> I should not have said that. But um, yeah, just coming in like 10 minutes to closing that. It just, you know, luckily I don't have to be in the kitchen, but, you know, it's just, it annoys my brother, okay? It does. Oh, I hear you. Patrick, what do you think? Uh, Yelp. <laughs> Yelp. Oh. I've been hearing that. You guys are all on it too, right? Everybody here is on Yelp. No, I used to. Uh, no, I think that, that it's not that I dislike Yelp or... TripAdvisor, or OpenTable, or, or any of the review sites. In fact, they're an incredible tool for us to use. Um, I don't dig anonymous reviews of just like shit all over you. I just I don't understand the purpose of that. I'll never understand it. It's just it's like um, it's like those videos on YouTube of the guys going through like the McDonald's drive-through and they're like the, the milkshake and they yeah. throw it back in there. It's just like all right, that was awesome. Thanks for ruining my dining. Like. <laughs> You know, ultimately, our job here is to hear what our guests are saying and try to respond in kind and, and, and try to make your experience better. Um, and it's not easy what we do. I mean, it's like it's crazily hard um, to get everything so that you don't know anything happened. I mean, it's like crazy hard. And, um, and I'm not looking for a free pass on, on Yelp. If you had a shitty experience, I would expect to hear about it. Um, <clears throat> But what we'd like to do is when we get feedback, whether it's positive or negative, we like to follow up. We like to send an email or, or make a phone call if you left your number and, and just say, you know, what happened and what can we do to make it better? This is not just here where we've been open less than a year. It's also at a restaurant that's been open to five years in Charlotte. This is not something we're doing just because we're new or new-ish. We're doing it because that's the right way to follow up on guests. Your experience is extended far past the four walls of brick and mortar, five church, or wherever you're at. Dells or anywhere else, recovery room. It's, it's like the experience goes online, it's viral, it goes to your house. And so if you're willing to give any of us, I'd imagine, feedback, um, then I think most of us would be very proactive to try to resolve it. But if you're like, uh, my name is Joe Schmo, and I really wanted to like the place, but I was disappointed because the hostess was rude and because you know the steak was undercooked, it's like, uh, yeah, hurt. How do we fix it for you? How do we make your experience better? And so I think, I think the process of like trying to make the overall experience better doesn't stop with our end of things. I know that seems strange, but you guys are absolutely part of that process because you're the ones that are not only feeding the business from a financial standpoint, but you're also the ones giving us all the information as to what we need to make the operation better for everybody that comes through the door. And um, I don't like environments where it's totally anonymous and, and people can just be kind of hateful or just negative because, you know, we're all about the love. Like, we just want everybody to be happy and, and, and walk out of here feeling good about their experience. Excellent. I'm going to ask you one more question before we just take it to the audience and I'll let Paul take it on. Um, craziest moment, funniest story, one of those. Uh, okay. Um, geez. Uh, when we opened here, our opening night, um, the way the plumbing for this building works is that there's a main line that runs out to the backyard and there's a line that runs uh, to the city main. And I guess it's old cast iron and it's rusted and so um, people were uh, flushing toilet paper down the toilet and it got blocked up. Uh, I know this is disgusting, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it's opening night, we've been open for like an hour and a half and raw sewage started pouring out of our toilets and the floor drains and sinks. Uh, anywhere where there was a drainage a hole of any kind behind the bar, you had raw sewage. Opening night. This is opening night. Opening night. Anybody been through an opening in a restaurant before? Okay, now we've got raw sewage from Charleston, from Market Street, like coming through uh, the drains. So that was pretty, pretty bad. Pretty bad. 
Um, gosh, funny moment. I mean, instead of just the restaurant, I think from being a partner with my mom in Dell's Vibes and being a, I think at the time that I was opening, I was still at CFC and I was teaching um, children's yoga at Mitchell. Um, <clears throat> and I was trying to have a social life because my mom was like, no, once you open up your own location, you're not going to be able to do two events in one night. And I was just like, whatever, mom, you're old. I got this. I can do this. And um, I had a night where I tried to go out and have a good time after I closed. This is just for somebody who's maybe thinking about opening your own location while you're still in your youth um, and trying to balance your social life. Um, yeah, and it was horrible. It was, it was the worst decision ever. Um, <laughs> and I remember um, coming to the juice bar, really, I was hungover. And I'm a juice lady, and so I don't absorb his alcohol very good. Um, and I was just like, I was out of it. And I was just in the, I had um, an employee um, who was looking out for me. He was an older friend. He knew my mom very well. And my mom comes in, and I had like, the shades down, I was in the bathroom, and she was just like, what are you doing? I was like, ma, turn the lights off. Does is not opening right now. And she was just like, oh, you're gonna work through this. You're gonna have to learn how to balance your social life with being a business owner, because you know, in F&B, people, they feed off of your energy. And for me, it was, um, that was a big learning experience, you know? Yeah, okay, all right. And that's why she's beautiful, because she's drinking juices every day, and I'm boozing it up. <laughs> I think they aged like 20 years in the past 10. Um, I could obviously give you a hundred horrible nightmare stories from Recovery Room, and from my years at the strip club, or many other clubs that I worked at in Boston or whatnot. But I'll keep this one kind of fun. Uh, about two years into Rec Room opening, I was, I was still closing at least five nights a week, and there every morning doing ordering and receiving. So needless to say, I was a little tired. And one night, I, don't know, I had a pretty good crowd. I was bartending by myself and, uh, you know, looking at the clock. I'm like, oh, it's getting, getting close for last call. Um, everyone's having a good time. You know, just kind of letting this thing roll. Finally, like, I turn the lights on. I'm like, all right, everyone, you know, last call. Come up, get a beer, get a shot while you can. And everyone just turns around. They're like, man, no, it's, oh, we're good, man. Thanks for letting us stay. And I'm like, all right, you know, a couple people say that, a few more people. There were maybe like 25 people in the bar at that point. And I was like, huh, that was like the easiest last call I've ever done in my life. So I like, I don't know, sweep, mop, do everything. Two hours later, I get in my car and the clock says it's like 6 a.m. And I'm like, man, it couldn't have taken that long to, to close, the, close up the bar. I'm usually, usually it says like 4, 4.15 or something like that. And I, I realized I was so tired that I couldn't even read my own clock behind the bar, and I just accidentally stayed open late that night. And not one person in that bar said anything to me. They were just like, this place is awesome, man. Let's just keep going. Oh, yeah, no, they stay up until 3.30, like, every night. And uh, so the next night, I was bartending, went home and slept for a while that night. And next to him, I'm like, you assholes. I could have, like, gotten in a huge amount of trouble. And they're like, no, nah, I was totally cool, man. No one would have known. Uh, I'm, I'm Paul Roof, and let's give our uh, panel a, a round of applause. <laughs>